Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in to the third and final part of the 2016 historic extravaganza here on this Christmas day at gazroses.com. Big thank you to everybody for tuning in on your Christmas day. Uh, it's been a marathon of videos as we are exploring the year of uh, 1879 and this is the final uh, part of the trilogy of videos covering the year of 1879. So for part one... Uh, we looked at the winter of 1878 and 1879. For part two, we looked at the spring and summer of uh, 1879. It was a terrible summer. And then for this third and final part, we are going to look at the autumn of 1879 and the winter of 1879-1880. Uh, we've already ex examined what happened in 1879, a huge amount of lawn blocking, and the upshot was that it's the coldest year since 1740. There hasn't been a year colder than 1879 since, and that includes 1963, which actually was a colder winter in 1963 than the winter of 1878-1879. But uh, because uh, the rest of the year in 1963 wasn't uh, that bad, uh, so the actual yearly temperature of 1963 was nowhere near as cold as 1879. If you want to see what a true cold year looks like, um, watch the rest of part three and then go and have a look at parts one and two if you haven't yet done so. So I'm going to round up the trilogy in a moment, but before I get on with that, just to uh, say about the ads, there's links to articles on all the pages, have a browse widgets and click through the links. If there's any articles that you can see, you're going to be helping us to pay for our website. Thanks very much for doing that. This video ads on most pages, which own our content, when you watch it, it goes back up again, it does help to pay for gas with this. Thanks so much to everybody for tuning in on your Christmas day. Uh, if you can't watch this video uh, right now, or if you can't watch the other parts and you want to come back and see them, you'll be able to because... Uh, all three parts are going to be kept within the historic archive at gasworthies.com. So they'll be at the website indefinitely and you can come back and watch them on demand whenever you would like uh, to do that. I've just explained about websites we're using to help create these historic videos. Couldn't do them without both the Historic Archive of Charts at wetacentral.d. Their Historic Archive goes back to... Uh, January 1871, and um, this is the farthest back I've ever been, actually, with the historic archive of charts, but we could go even further back than this. And uh, also, the uh, information here, a lot of it is coming from Trevor Harley's personal weather website. And I have to also give a heads up to uh, my good friend Kevin, Kevin Bradshaw, also known on the forums as Mr. Data. He's supplied a lot of additional uh, information, and I'm going to give you Kevin Kevin's website right now, it's uh, ukweatherworld.co.uk. you find the link to all three of those websites on the links page. Uh, the reason I had to get additional information is because it's so, so much time has elapsed between uh, then and now, so long ago, that there wasn't a huge amount of information on Trevor Harley's personal weather website. So I turned to Kevin and he supplied me uh, with a lot of extra information. A big thank you to uh, Kevin, to Trevor and to wetcentral.d. I couldn't do these historic videos without uh, these websites and these people. Um, I'm just the narrator really on the uh, smallest uh, cog in a much bigger wheel uh, for these historic videos. So uh, a big thank you to uh, those free websites and free people for allowing this to uh, happen. And with that, I'd better get on with uh, part three. We're going to start off where we left off with part two. So we're starting on the first day of autumn, on the 1st of September, 1879. A lot of, um, not a lot of information to go on uh, with a lot of these uh, months. So, for example, with uh, September 1879, all I've got to go with is the central England temperature, which came out at 12.6. I don't have any more additional information, but from the charts, it should be fairly easy to see what happened. So we had that appalling summer. We uh, know that the summer of 1879 was absolutely dreadful. Uh, and we go to the first day of autumn. What happens? You've guessed it. The Azores High finally makes, uh, makes an appearance. It was very conspicuous by its absence through most of the summer of 1879. But here we are on the 3rd of September with a little bit of warmer weather pushing up from the southwest. That looks quite nice, especially for England and Wales. That continues into the 3rd of September. 2nd, 3rd brings a lot of dry and pretty warm weather to England. Wales. a little bit more 
unsettled for Scotland, probably, with a westerly wind there. But look at the upper air temperatures. How, how many times did we see the 15 Celsius isotherm getting in across England and Wales um, during the summer? Not very often at all, but there it is on the 3rd of September. It was a very warm and um, pleasant day. I assume temperatures would have been easily into the low to mid-20s Celsius there with that uh, amount of sunshine. However, we know that September 1879 was another uh, month within the 15 that we've already established were cold and average. We know from part one, part two, that we had a run of uh, 15 consecutive cold of an average months going from uh, November uh, 1878 through to January 1880, 15 months on the trot that were colder than average. So despite this very warm start, pleasant start that we have, September 879, obviously things are going to go rather down the pan. And it all begins to go a bit wrong again here on the 4th. We're bringing some sort of cold front down across the country that's introducing cooler air from the north and the northwest. Then we get the high pressure back in again, but that is within cooler air uh, by this point. You see the upper air temperatures are becoming much lower, especially in the north, that could even be producing ground frost for parts of Scotland. Then that high pressure starts to weaken as we go through to the 6th and on to the 7th. It turns much more unsettled. Heavy rain then starting to drive in from the Atlantic in pretty dismal uh, temperatures as well. We know from uh, the first couple of uh, parts uh, to this historic extravaganza that we had lots of northern blocking around Greenland and Iceland during 1879 and there we are again on the 7th of September with above average pressure around Greenland and Iceland once more it's coming back in terms of northern blocking. On the 8th looks very unsettled lots of low pressure around the country then and into the 10th of September still really unsettled quite cool as well with winds coming down from the northwest. This continues up to the middle part of the month, still low pressure, very much dominating, so a lot of heavy rain and very cool uh, temperatures then. Now into the second half of the month, get a bit of a change, high pressure begins to re-establish across Scandinavia with low pressure out to the northwest, so it's having a go at getting a little bit warmer there on the 18th of September, but it doesn't really come off, and by the 21st, low pressure is flattening off that ridge over Scandinavia and returning the winds to the west uh, once again. Remember, this month has a central temperature of 12.6, so it is a significantly colder than average uh, month. That's around a degree colder than average. Looks very unsettled on the 24th of September, so not only cool, but also very wet, with uh, low pressure driving in. Looks really autumnal there. Uh, and then through to the end of September, again, the Azores High tries to throw up a ridge. Actually, it is um, pushing a ridge up in towards central parts of uh, Europe, so it's starting to turn drier, and probably a little bit milder as well, as we end the month of September 18. However, overall, it looks like it was a very cool and unsettled month. So we go through to October 1879, and uh, this month has a central England temperature of 8.9, which is, uh, again, significantly uh, colder than average. It's around a degree and a half uh, colder than average. And we start off with low pressure coming in off the Atlantic again. So that little ridge of pressure that we have at the beginning of September, that really doesn't amount to much. And uh, we go into the 1st of October and low pressure is coming back in uh, once more. Get through towards the 5th of October, however, we're getting a little build of pressure there from the southwest, so that's uh, looking a little bit better, trying to turn a bit warmer uh, again, and that continues into the sea. If there could be fog with this. Remember, this is back before the Clean Air Act, which uh, was established in the 1950s. So it's back into the Industrial Revolution. There's lots of chimneys churning out loads of smoke and soot. So any high pressure at this point of the year... Uh, from, a, uh, from October right way through into the winter is going to be producing probably a lot of fog. And we do have to take that into account with these months back in the Victorian era that are cold. Some of that, not all of it, but some of it is probably down to just lots of smoke, lots of fog, uh, limiting temperatures by day. Uh, in particular, and that's particularly so, of course, in these autumn months, which in sunshine would probably be relatively warm, but under fog are going to be quite cold. Actually, I should say smog uh, rather than fog. 
So we keep this high pressure going through to the 7th of October 1879. Very, very dominant there. And the upper air temperatures are looking pleasantly warm as well. In theory, this would be quite a warm start to October. I'm not sure what the temperatures were doing on this day, but uh, you could get temperatures into the uh, low 20s Celsius, I would have thought, with that, depending on whether it's all fogged up. If it's fogged up, then uh, no, that wouldn't happen. Obviously, we're going to have to get some cold uh, weather soon, because we know that, again, this is another month in that uh, run of 15 consecutive cold and average month, and a CET for October of 8.9 is significantly colder than average. The 8th of October has high pressure centred right over the top of the country. What's going to happen? Where's it going to go? Well, it's still there, right in over the UK on the 12th of October, showing no signs of abating. Again, there could be a lot of fog and smog in with that. Three to the 13th, is it going to go anywhere interesting? Well, yes it is. By the time you get through to the 14th, look at this, it's beginning to make its move back up towards Greenland and Iceland. How often did we see that during part one and part two of this historic roundup uh, for 1879? So often we had high pressure going up to Greenland and Iceland, and there it goes again on the 14th. We've got a deep trough coming down into Scandinavia, turning the winds into the north of them. Winter really starting to bite. There's the upper air temperatures showing most of the UK on the 14th of October is still within relatively warm air, but cold air is lurking. It's plunging into Scandinavia. And uh, look at that. We go through to the 15th, a proper blocking feature in around Iceland. Yet again, the winds are going into the north, dragging much colder air down across the country from the north and the northeast. There's the upper air temperatures for the 15th of October, 1879, turning significantly colder. And we go through to the 16th, looking cold. The high pressure slipping down over the UK then. But we've got really cold north northeasty winds, or really cold for the time of year. With most parts of Europe now back within Arctic air, the minus five isotherm coming through. That would certainly be producing some hard overnight frost, probably also producing snow showers down the eastern side of the country on the 16th of October. 17th brings an area of low pressure through and turns it milder just very briefly but then look what's going to happen go through to the 18th and into the 19th uh yeah we bring more low pressures through the country and they're on a northwest southeast trajectory so this is plunging scandinavia into quite severe cold air again for us we are bringing colder air down from the north there could certainly be some wintry precipitation in with this as these low pressures are moving northwest southeast for northern parts of the country particularly there could well be some snow and then we go through towards the 23rd and on to the 25th and it do it all over again another low pressure comes down on the northwest southeast uh, trajectory each one of these low pressures probably introducing colder air behind so again for the north i think this is actually it doesn't look all that um wintry but i think for the north this could have could have been quite a wintry month really in october 1879 of course less so uh, for the south 26th we uh, take that low pressure and start to drop it to the south with a ridge building to the north again so the ridge is extending through the atlantic up towards Iceland, there it goes, and by the time you get through 27th, it's building over Scandinavia, starting to turn the winds back into the east. That was another very present feature, particularly of uh, part one. And then we end October with lots of high pressure dominating. This is within much colder air now, so we're getting severe frost to the end of October 1879, probably a lot of fog uh, as well, and smog. It looks a really cold end to the month. Now we go through to November 1879, and this month has a central temperature of 4.1. Again, it's significantly cold on average, and we're going to set up another severe cold spell through the course of of this month. Look at that once again, the 1st of November 1879. We've got all of this blocking again centred around Greenland and Iceland. How often did we see that in the first two parts? And we're turning the winds again into the north. So cold air pushing down from the Arctic. There would certainly be hard overnight frost. There'd probably be snow showers in northern and eastern parts of the country as well. We move on through up towards the uh, 2nd and on 
uh, to the upper air temperatures for the first and the second. And you notice it turns very cold uh, yet again. So there we are on the second with the wind going into the north and the northeast, bringing that very cold air down from the Arctic. Another trough is in over Scandinavia, producing lots of snow for them. These northerly winds would have been bringing snow showers down across many parts of the UK, I think, on the 2nd of November. There's your prayer temperatures for the 1st. There's your prayer temperatures for the 2nd. A big plunge in temperature again. Really cold air surging uh, from the Arctic. And that continues into the 3rd as well. We stay cold and wintry. The high pressure is more centred to the west of us on the 3rd of November. The winds are in from the east or northeast. That could certainly have been bringing snow showers into eastern and southeastern parts of the country. And again, there would have been hard overnight frost. Bonfire night, 1879, takes that high pressure down over the country. Again, within very cold air, so you would expect lots of freezing fog. Probably less of a snow risk, but it would have been another cold bonfire night with a lot of frost and uh, probably smoke and fog and smog as well. And that high pressure just continues really up to the 8th. It stays dry, frosty and cold under that area of high pressure. The temp begins to move the high pressure over towards uh, Eastern Europe. And then we start to allow somewhat milder air in from the Atlantic just for a few days. But by the 12th, yes, the winds are coming back into the north again. Well, how many northerly uh, days, how many days with northerly winds there were? during the year of 1879. It must be getting on uh, for a record. There we are on the 13th. We're back into the northerly again. Really cold across Scandinavia. Snow showers probably affecting northern and eastern parts of the country and more overnight frost. Again, we see the upper air temperatures looking really cold. That high pressure sits down over the country on the 14th, cutting off the snow risk. But again, under that high pressure, we've got lots of frost and uh, probably fog going on as well. The 15th begins to move that high pressure up towards Scandinavia. Got a cold trough covering most parts of Europe there. That's bringing snow to many parts of Europe. The winds are trying to back into the east. This is very reminiscent of the patterns that we saw through the winter of 1878-1879. Does the uh, atmosphere have a memory? It's an ongoing point of uh, discussion on the forums uh, and with weather enthusiasts, does the atmosphere have a memory or not? This is certainly very close, again, to what happened through that first winter, winter of 1878-1879. So uh, we're trying to set up the Scandinavian high on the 17th of November uh, 1879. It was really cold through Central Europe. Uh, just things go a little bit wrong on the 18th. It was a bit milder then. We get a push from the Atlantic, probably with some rain. But by the 19th, look at that. Pressure really building through the UK, going up to Scandinavia. And the actual centre of the pressure is over there in uh, Russia. That's a proper Siberian high, uh, pushing out really, really early uh, in 1879. So that turns the wings into the east on the 20th of November. We're bringing in easterly wings yet again, uh, and that's bringing in yet again more cold air uh, from Europe. So snow showers pushing in across England and Wales uh, with those easterly wings and cold upper air temperatures on the 20th and 21st of November. Very much in an easterly flow here on the 21st. And that continues up to the 22nd as well. 23rd, we've got retrogression again. So we've got the high pressure there over Scandinavia on the 21st of November. Look where it goes by the time you get through to the 23rd. It's gone and sent itself over Greenland and Iceland, which turns the winds from the east to the north. And it's staying cold, but just changing the snow dis distribution from the east to the northern part of the country. And then it's all back into easterly again on the 25th. This is a prolonged and severe cold spell of weather that is now starting uh, to set up. The high pressure goes back up towards Greenland again on the 26th. Bitterly cold air still feeding in from the east. And keep an eye 
on this trough that's here over Scandinavia. Look what this is going to do as we head in towards uh, the start of December. So check this out. We go to 27th on to the 28th. And notice the cold pool is intensifying with that trough over Scandinavia. Severely cold air now is starting to plunge through Scandinavia southwards into Europe. Again, look at all that blocking that we've got around Greenland and Iceland. So often that we saw that from the autumn of 1878, it's still going on a year later with the wind still in from the north and the northeast. And that takes us to the end of the month of November 1879, where we now have a severe cold spell in place. We've got a very deep cold pool centred across Scandinavia and most parts of Europe as well. We've got huge amounts of blocking again around Greenland and Iceland. The North Atlantic Oscillation is negative. We're taking all this low pressure into Spain and the Med with the jet stream. And that's just another, uh, another severe cold spell setting up. The autumn of 1879 was the 34th coldest autumn on record. And a lot of that is down to what happens in November, which again is a very cold and uh, wintry month. So that takes us through to the start of another winter. And we go to the 1st of December 1879. Uh, December 1879 has a central England temperature of 0 0.7 degrees. So it isn't beneath freezing. It's not a minus month, but it is another very, very cold uh, month, certainly in terms of what we get to experience now in 2016. If we had a month as cold as this, we would certainly be quite shocked about it, I think. The coldest part actually occurs through the first opening period of uh, December 1879. We get some extraordinarily uh, cold weather, not just in the UK, but across most parts of Europe as well. So this is how we begin. Again, we've got loads and loads of blocking here through uh, the Atlantic, going up towards Greenland as well. And then the trough is all through uh, Europe, and the bitterly cold air is extending down uh, across the country as well. We move through uh, to the second, and it looks very wintry, doesn't it? We've got lots of blocking around Greenland and Iceland. The winds are in from the east and the northeast. These areas of low pressure, they're shallow, but they're probably producing uh, outbreaks of snow or showery bursts of snow across many parts of the country. The second of uh, December uh, 1879 recorded a temperature of minus 21.1, severely cold. It gets even colder on the 3rd. This is how the upper air temperatures look for the 2nd of December 1879. Again, severely cold air is covering most northern and central parts of Europe and down into the UK as well. This is an even colder day on the 3rd of December 1879, we have a temperature of minus 26, say that again, minus 26.7 degrees at Springwood Park, Kelso. And there was an unsubstantiated uh, recording of minus 30.6 at Blackadder Water at Kelso. That isn't an official record because it wasn't an official uh, site. It's not a reliable record, but there is that caveat that uh, on this day, we might have seen the temperature go to minus 30 degrees somewhere in the UK, which is perhaps the only time that uh, has ever happened. In any case, the official temperature for this day is minus 26.7 and that uh, record stood until 1995. It stood, well, getting on for 100 years, um, uh, over 100 years, actually. Uh, so uh, quite incredible temperature, minus 26.7. And early as well, that uh, record was beaten in 1995 at the end of December 1995. So it was beaten uh, right at the end of the month. I think it was 30th or the 31st of December 1995, whereas this is right at the beginning of December. So quite extraordinary, uh, quite extraordinary how cold it is on the 3rd of December. 
The fourth looks like we're bringing a blizzard up into the south with this area of low pressure around the Bay of Biscay trying to push milder air up from the south. There'd be a weather front. Certainly that would be impacting southwesting, possibly southern counties as well with strong winds and heavy outbreaks of snow. The temperature recorded on this day, the 4th of December, uh, 1879 was minus 22.2 .2. that was the low temperature uh, recorded again look at how extensive the cold pool is over the UK and across most parts of Europe as well severely cold once more this is undoubtedly bringing snow to many southern and southeastern parts on the 5th of December I'm sure that will be very heavy snow as well probably producing drifting and blizzards down in the south. Not quite as severe with the temperature on this day, probably because it's more unstable in the atmosphere, so there's more cloud and snow around. But the uh, recorded low on this day, 5th of December, was minus 18.9. Still an incredibly cold temperature. Again, there's the upper air temperatures, severe cold air covering most of Europe and again extending into the UK. All starts to go rather flabby on the 6th and I think uh, we're probably getting snow showers coming through here. It looks quite trophy, so I would assume there's a lot of snow showers there. And the uh, recorded minimum was lower on uh, the 6th. We go down to minus 20.0, minus 21.0 I should say on the 6th of uh, December. And then through to the 7th and on to the 8th, what happens is that high pressure begins to slink down over the country. So we start to push the very coldest of the air over towards the eastern part of Europe. But this is still within very cold air, so we're certainly getting some severe overnight frost, but we're losing those northerly and easy winds. We're losing the snow risk. The, uh, low, the minimum uh, low on this day was minus 17 Point eight on the 8th of December, 1879. Quite an incredible spell of uh, severely cold weather for so early in the winter. Notice the upper air temperature showing the very coldest of the air is beginning to retreat into eastern parts of Europe and it's starting to turn less cold out to the west. That continues up to the temp as well. And then just have lots of very quiet and benign weather taking place, really. So high pressure is dominant then through uh, to the middle part of the month. The upper air temperatures are lifting up on the 13th, but we're within high pressure, so we aren't really feeling the effects of lifting the upper air temperatures up. Uh, actually, it's still very cold. There'll be a lot of severe frost and no doubt freezing fog under this area of high pressure as well. But it isn't the deep cold pool that we have through that opening week or so. It actually turns a bit milder in the north, particularly on the 15th. We're bringing in a westerly, southwesterly flow, so that starts to thaw things out. The northern parts of the country, southern areas, I think, still largely cold and frosty. And then the high pressure comes back as we run up towards Christmas 1879. Get a lot of dry weather. Again, I think this is quite cold for England and Wales. I think it's really happened to stir the atmosphere up there. So more frost, more fog. But the north does look milder there as we're up to Christmas Eve. Christmas Day, 1879, looks like bad. Technically, it would be a fairly mild one for the north anyway. For the south, I think still probably a lot of frost and fog. And that's how Boxing Day looks as well. On the 28th, we get a real push of mild air uh, coming in from uh, the southwest, and uh, actually the stormy winds that are sweeping in from the Atlantic do something a little bit unusual. They uh, produce uh, water spouts, uh, and that caused the collapse of the Old Tay Railway Bridge um, on the 28th, and it killed 74 people, so a devastating event taking place on this day, 28th of December 1879, in what looks like a much milder and stormy west or southwesterly flow coming through. We end the year uh, with uh, westerlies coming in. That's been quite cold air as well. And uh, that's how we end 1879 on a traditionally uh, cold note. Remember, this year of 18. Uh, 79 has a central England temperature uh, for the year of 7.44, uh, which is the coldest year since 1714, and there hasn't been a year colder than that, uh, colder than that since, and that's how we ended it on 
A coal, no, but it's Atlantic driven coal. It's not Siberian or Arctic coal. So um, actually, it probably wouldn't have felt too bad for the folks living back then. I'll just quickly run you through uh, January 1880. This was another cold month. This is our last uh, month that is cold and average. This is 15 out of uh, 15. This one comes in with a central England temperature. Again, it's uh, very close to freezing. Uh, 0 0.9 degrees, so it's just 0.9 of a degree above being a freezing month. We start off again with southwesterly winds coming in uh, from the Atlantic, bringing milder air on New Year's Day. Very quickly, we break out of that and build high pressure up from the southwest. That high pressure is dominant uh, through to the 9th, and then on to the 12th, high pressure really in control across central Europe. Now, we have these charts now. It probably won't be all that cold. Could get frost, but there'd be a fair amount of uh, pleasant weather by day, potentially, with some sunny spells. The coldness of the air going down into South East Europe. Actually, as I'm doing the video in uh, for Christmas 2016, we've had a lot of days through December 2016 that looked uh, like this in terms of the pressure distribution. And we know we've had a pretty mild month for December uh, 2016. Back then, this would be a much colder scenario. Again, I have to re-emphasise how much fog and smog we would get under these type of conditions due to the Industrial Revolution, and that would have the effect of dimming out the sun and making it much colder uh, than we would have it now with the same sort of pattern. There's your bread temperature show, but it is technically looking mild. But down on the surface, by word, that will be very cold and uh, frosty. Whoops, that shouldn't have happened. So let's just go back to uh, January. There we go. And then we go up to middle bound. I'm going to get a colder uh, spell trying to get going again. So look at this. We go back to what we had so often through 1879. Maybe a new year, uh, but uh, it's going to go back to that pattern, which we're taking the high pressure over the UK on the 13th and setting it up to the west of us on the 14th, back over towards Greenland and Iceland. Winds are going back into the north yet again, bringing much colder air with them. On the 15th of January, yes, the winds are in from the north. Another deep trough is in over Scandinavia. That looks pretty severe for them once again. And there's your rare temperatures showing once more that cold air surging down across Europe with those northerly winds undoubtedly bringing snow showers to northern and eastern parts of the country. There's the high pressure out to the west of us. There's the wind in from the north. <coughs> Excuse me, for northern east airs that would undoubtedly be bringing snow. The high pressure is backing towards Iceland on the 18th. So we've gone cold again. This looks like it's trying to set up Another pretty severe spell of weather, uh, actually. Certainly be some severe night frost, probably uh, freezing fog and potentially snow as well. The 19th of January, 1880, still looking uh, very cold. Still looking cold on the 20th under this ridge of high pressure. But now we're going to start to see a change, and it's a very dramatic and a very quick change as well. The 21st, yes, still very cold under that area of high pressure, and dry. This is a remarkably dry January in uh, 1880. Uh, I think it was the driest uh, that we have recorded until 1997. Uh, so it's an exceptionally dry month under all of that high pressure. Uh, and again, very cold with the upper air temperatures for most parts of Europe on the 21st. High pressure goes on 22nd, but a change is coming. The high pressure is starting to slip towards Central Europe here on the 26th of January. Still very cold, undoubtedly, but notice the blue colours and low pressure is beginning to come back there uh, to the north. It's beginning to show signs that the polar vortex, which has basically been out of action um, for 15 months, is now just starting to... Uh, re-emerge and as we go through 27th on to the 28th the high pressure clings on across the south keeping it cold there but the flow is beginning to go back into west and southwest uh, and low pressure is gathering around Iceland 
out in the Atlantic. The colours are darkening. Notice the purples beginning to appear across green and the polar vortex is reforming. It's re-emerging. It's coming back. And by the time we end the month, uh, most northern parts have gone back into a mild Atlantic flow. The southeast is probably still hanging on to cold weather by its fingertips. The high pressure is actually centred now over the Black Sea. But the writing is on the wall. The polar vortex is re-establishing itself. It's starting to strike back. The polar vortex strikes back. And as we go through into February, we're going to get our first mild of an average month for 15 months. The temperature, central temperature for February 1880 comes out at 5.8, which is the first uh, non cold average month since October 1878. An extraordinary run of 15 cold average months is broken, and it happens with the Atlantic finally staging a fight back, finally pushing that high pressure down into southeast Europe. Low pressure begins to break through, bringing the first substantial rain that we've had for quite a long while across the country. And then by the 8th of February 1880, we are back into firmly Atlantic-driven conditions. The polar vortex is back in business and the winds are in from the west. Now, it's not quite that structured straightforward because we go through to the middle part of the month again we're trying to get back to that cold winter pattern notice all of this high pressure that's up here across russia setting into scandinavia that is trying to bring bring us back into blocking and back into very cold conditions and what happens is that a real battle emerges on the 15th and then on into the 16th yes we're very close to bringing the winds into the east again but actually it's this area of low pressure in the atlantic that is now the driver the winds are in from the south and the southwest so it's much milder and there's a lot of heavy rain driving in with this deep area of low pressure as well bands of rain sweeping up across the country but my word is that close again to bring the winds back into the east, and uh, off we go again. Look how cold it was still across Scandinavia and northern Europe on the 17th of December 1880. But for us, we are firmly within those milder conditions at uh, long last. I'm sure it must have been a relief for the people living back then. The high pressure begins to recede back into Russia on the 19th. The Atlantic has the battle won, uh, so it just continues very wet, windy and mild through towards the uh, latter stages of uh, February 1880. Again, Mesviaprea temperatures showing how mild it is on the 21st and that the cold air is receding back into Russia. We go towards the end of the month, actually it tries to get colder again, tried to build a bit of pressure over Scandinavia, tried to get winds in from the east, that winds do go a bit easily there on the 24th, so that's a little bit colder, but it doesn't really last, it's a very half-hearted attempt to buy the 26th, again the Wesleys are breaking back through, and uh, well we're firmly in a stormy westerly flow there as we end the winter, actually the actual end of the winter could be the 29th, that's it. Uh, we end the winter uh, on February 29th, bringing in the flow from the Atlantic. All of the blocking has gone and we've reverted back to our traditional pattern of high pressure through the Azores and going in towards the Med. I mean, low pressure all up here, up here, and the jet stream coming through like that. We have gone back to our proper, our typical winter pattern in the UK and Europe. And that's how we end this uh, look at the year of 1879. So that's it. That's the uh, year all done and dusted. That's the three parts uh, done for you. Hope you enjoyed the uh, look at the year of 1879. I'd normally show you some pictures now, but I can't do that. So I'm going to show you a bit of reanalysis from our good friend James Acrill, uh, who has supplied me with some reanalysis re charts. Big thank you to James, as always, for doing this. So uh, this is how the 500 uh, millibar height anomaly looks for the autumn 
of uh, 1878. Again, very, 1879, I should say. Again, very blocked with high pressure through the Atlantic and going up towards Greenland. Means that the mean wind flow was generally from the north or the northeast, more blocking through the uh, autumn. The temperature anomaly for the autumn of 1879, significantly cold on average. Again, that's indicative of what we had through the year, this area of cold which stretches from the Pacific down to North Africa. Very unusual band of cold temperature anomalies uh, be so clearly defined like that. We get it again on this side of uh, the world as well uh, down there. So another significantly colder than every season in uh, the autumn of, <coughs> excuse me, 18. 79. Uh, that's how December's uh, temperature anomalies look. It was a very severely cold December, as we've already established, particularly through central parts of uh, Europe, but also the UK was impacted by that uh, severe cold as well. Those temperature anomalies for Central Europe are going down to something like minus uh, 6 degrees or minus uh, 6 below average, 6 degrees below average, incredibly cold temperature anomalies there through most parts of uh, Europe during December 1879. Didn't really touch on that, but Europe was extraordinarily cold uh, through that early part, particularly of the month. That's how the um, height anomaly looks for the winter of 1879-1880. Uh, Notice very different. Uh, we've, we lose the northern blocking, very dry winter, till we got to February anyway, lots of high pressure, but it was centred much more over the UK and across Europe, and this is all indicative of eventually what happened by February anyway, the polar vortex uh, re-emerging. Uh, and that's how the temperature anomaly is looked for uh, the winter of um, 1879-1880. It was still a colder than average winter, particularly for England and Wales, but nothing like as extreme as we had. Um, nothing like as extre extremely cold as we had through the winter that went before. Finally, I'll just show you the height anomalies that we've looked at. So this is how uh, a reminder of how the height anomaly looked for December uh, to February 1878 to 1879. Again, a so much blocking centre right over green and extraordinary amounts of blocking with that trough really cold trough underneath it. That's how the spring looked. The blocking was in a slightly different position. It's more centred through the northern Atlantic, but it did also go up towards Greenland. Uh, and then the trough again through Central Europe. It meant that the mean flow through the spring of 1879 was generally from the northeast or the north. The blocking came back across Greenland in the summer. That's a 500 millibar height anomaly for the summer of 1879. Again, extraordinary amounts of blocking around Greenland. That deep trough centred over Western Europe. It was a terrible summer. Possibly it was the worst summer ever recorded in the UK, the summer of 1879. And then the autumn rounded it all off with lots of blocking again. And uh, it's a little bit more centred to the Atlantic. So maybe you could see how things were going to go, that the blocking was beginning to reposition, beginning to lose its influence, but still enough to produce very cold uh, autumn, particularly so in November. And then finally, the winter of 1879-1880 breaks out of the blocking and we reposition the high pressure across Europe, which allows low pressure to come back through Greenland and Iceland. And yes, the winds begin to go milder. And that's the end of that. However, it wasn't quite the end because uh, the following winter, 1880, 1881, had more very severely cold weather. And that's for another time and another day and another place. But uh, we will probably look at the winter of 1880, 1881 at some point in the future. Right, and at just over 40 minutes, that rounds it all up. So, again, big thank you to everybody uh, for watching. I think 
the three parts per trilogy has come out to over two hours of viewing. So if you've watched it all in one go on this Christmas Day, well done to you. Big thanks to watching on Christmas Day. If you haven't managed to watch it all in one go, it's fine. You can come back and watch it whenever you uh, would like to do that. But at just over, or just nearly 44 minutes, all it remains is, to be, is for me to wish you all a very Merry Christmas. Uh, things will be back to normal at Gazza this tomorrow on Boxing Day uh, with the usual uh, video update. But uh, thanks so much for tuning in on this Christmas Day. Enjoy what's left of your Christmas. And that's all for now. Thanks for watching.